Hey, it's Luminosic. Welcome to the preparation and integration segment of the Psychedelics Masterclass. In this video, I'm going to share with you some of the most powerful and efficacious practices that I've extracted from decades of experience with both psychedelics and the Western mystery traditions. There will be valuable content here for both the casual novice and the experienced psychonaut that I have not seen anywhere else. You can expect nothing short of miraculous transformation and the eventual realization of the expression of your highest and truest self. By following the advice outlined in this video, you can expect nothing short of a miraculous transformation and the eventual realization of the expression of your truest and highest self, as well as the activation of latent capacities of mind. So hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon, where you can get exclusive content, sign up for Skype sessions, and keep track of events and special offers. First of all, I'd like to share a little bit about myself as a sort of case study. I was raised in abject poverty, surrounded by extreme violence and ignorance. And because we lived in a county where some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world lived, this poverty also made me an outcast. My mother had extreme mental health issues, in fact she committed suicide a couple of years ago, and my ever-revolving cast of father figures all had issues of their own. As a result of all this, I was infested with psychological and emotional issues. I would struggle with addiction, depression, I was prone to violence, and ultimately would even do a stint in prison. The bullet point here is that I am extreme proof of the efficacy of psychedelic medicine. Without any therapy or assistance, I've overcome addiction and successfully addressed all of my major psychological and emotional issues using the medicines and techniques that I'll share in this video. Just as important, however, these medicines have helped me to perceive the universe as a conscious organism and also to learn to use this awareness as a guide, allowing me to realize dreams and leading to all sorts of very improbable, yet very real and meaningful experiences. There are three basic stages in this process. First is the recognition of either an issue or desire to grow. This is what motivates us to take these compounds and engage in these practices in the first place. The next necessary stage is the identification and confrontation of debilitating traumas. On an energetic level, these fears and traumas represent a sort of interference pattern that can obscure self from self and create an experience of deep dissatisfaction with life in general. If this stage is successfully navigated, even in part, the next stage, actualizing your newly discovered potential, will manifest. You will achieve new levels of confidence, focus and clarity which will facilitate your ability to utilize your gains. As your mental and spiritual capacity increases and comes into alignment with a deeper sense of purpose, there's a chain reaction of positive developments. After you have dissolved negative perceptions of self, you will discover your true purpose. Also having simultaneously expanded your cognitive processing power, you will have enhanced memory, creative capacity, better emotional integration, balance and stability, and you will find yourself doing things easily that you would have imagined impossible or at least very likely in the past. As far as managing expectations goes, it's important not to have too high of expectations going into any scenario, but also you want to be careful about imposing ideas about limitation. Because in the clinical studies that have been done, people of average intelligence have spontaneously developed genius that's actually stuck. Huge leaps in cognitive prowess and technical ability on a musical instrument massive insights uh, in the most complex fields such as physics. So it's very important to go into these situations with an openness to the possibility that truly miraculous developments could take place as a result of these experiences. This expansion of consciousness uh, is largely about increasing self-awareness. We all have blind spots and some of those blind spots may pertain to our ideas about our own limitations. So we can actually impose limitations on ourselves that are totally false and self-generated. I'll give you an example from my own life recently. Uh, I had ideas about my capacity for comprehending music. I'm a musician, a guitarist, and I didn't think that I could consciously learn to play jazz. I'm capable of playing sophisticated music, but I thought only by ear. And in music like jazz, you have to be able to consciously think about the chords and arpeggios as the music is moving by, sometimes very quickly. And so I entered into a psychedelic state and I just happened to specifically confront this idea that I had this limitation. And I suddenly was able to pick a sophisticated piece of music, and this is during the psychedelic experience, and consciously think about my different options and also relate to time in a different way. But the point being that once I had reprogrammed this imprint, this idea of limitation that I had imposed on myself that was totally imaginary was suddenly just lifted. And I think that this experience may have been rooted in something that happened a few weeks earlier with a San Pedro experience. I took just a small amount before I did a performance and at one point during the performance I was actually able to compartmentalize my consciousness 
in such a way that it was as if I had my full attention directed at several different processes. So I could be fully conscious of my strumming hand, my improvisations with my left hand, my vibrato, I had the control of the diaphragm was separate, how I would relate to the beat, and I was able to consider all of these things simultaneously as if my full consciousness was directed at each one of them. Once we have had a conscious experience, that means that the neuropathways, the synapses have formed and there will always be there. So it's important to remind yourself and you know the other mindfulness practices and meditations that I outline in this video will be helpful for that. But once that print imprint is there once, it is possible for us to at any time recall these new developments of consciousness and apply them to scenarios in our lives. This process is one of expansion and contraction, systole and diastole, which is basically the fundamental process that underlies creation. Your consciousness is expanded, which means the parameters of available experience have changed. As your brain complexifies, so too does your perception and your experience. The second part of the process is contraction which is commonly called integration. This is not a process of reduction, but rather one of alchemical transmutation. The new information must be integrated in such a way that there is more volume and less space. The analogy of a laser is fitting. As the laser of your will and consciousness, the focus of your being, becomes more unified and focused, your ability to burn your mark into the fabric of the universe will be greatly facilitated. It is important to train the mind outside of these experiences, particularly with practices that reflect the process. Some exercises that I advise people that come to my ceremonies are several different types of meditation. One is the classic stillness meditation that I advise is done before bed. And this just involves focusing on the breath, emptying the mind, stilling the being, creating a receptive state. The second is to be done in the morning and involves focusing the mind. Uh, the tattvas that are used by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn are very useful for this practice. Basically, you would uh, choose one of them and say you have like a red square with a blue circle around it. The idea is to focus on this shape without letting anything change at all. And every time that there's any kind of change, you start over. Reformulate the shape intentionally until it's exactly as you are intending to perceive it and do not let it waver. You'll be very surprised at how difficult this is. But if you alternate these practices, uh, this will greatly facilitate your ability to navigate the psychedelic space. This meditation is also a great opportunity for testing your powers of manifestation. And you do this by placing an idea or experience in your day. This has to be within the realm of possibility, but uh, you want to choose something of relatively high improbability. And I'll give you an example that happened in my life recently. I had randomly chosen a book from the shelves, and the book uh, was talking about how a wizard is someone that can inject an experience very clearly and concisely that will actually manifest. And so I thought about this for a second and I said, okay, let's give this a shot. So one day I saw a coral snake coming down to the path into our house. I have not seen that snake again or had not seen that snake again or any other snake like it in the 18 months since. And I thought, I wanna see that coral snake today then. Let's see if I can inject this experience into my day. And so two hours later as I'm walking up the path, there's that coral snake. I did it again the next day, again with a snake. In the first case, this was actually, you know, the specific species of snake in the same place. So it was a very precise uh, projection of intention that apparently materialized. The third practice is pranayama, and this is the one to be done during the psychedelic state. The practice of pranayama basically involves breathing very deeply, so inundating the brain with oxygen, holding it in for a specified count, exhaling for a specified count and keeping the breath expelled for a specified count. And it's good to start with low numbers uh, in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The fourfold breath is what was used in the beginning. But as you develop some capacity for this, you use larger and larger numbers and then the effect of the pranayama is increased. And so when you're trying to engage in intentional reprogramming, this process of inundation and deprivation is not only great for flooding the brain with oxygen and helping it to do its work in creating new neuro connections, but it's also great for encouraging or deepening altered states with the deprivation phase. It is worth mentioning here that as you make yourself a fit vessel to attract and receive the energies that you require in your quest to manifest your will in the universe unobstructed. 
The universe will appear to conspire to assist you in ways that are unbelievable. While this is marvelous, it is not without danger. I talk a lot about developing new capacities of mind in my videos and also the parameters of experience that are available to us change. Uh, a good example is synchronicity. Our intuition improves, experiences of telepathy. The problem with this is that as Terence McKenna said, it is no accomplishment to hear a voice in your head but to figure out if it's telling the truth. And so this takes development, this takes practice. And it can be very exciting and this can compel people, for example, to start projecting synchronicities rather than allowing these experiences to develop organically and interpreting them for their meaning. People will really want to see them and really want to have these experiences after you've had a few correct intuitions also. Your desires, uh, we call these wish demons in the mystery schools, since you know that sometimes you can precognize, you'll start to possibly imagine intuitions or receive imaginary telepathy. In the interest of space in this video, I'll just say that it is important when you are first developing your ability to separate the wheat from the chaff, the gold from the dross, is to, for example, not take any risks pursuing an intuition that could negatively impact your mundane existence. One of the most neglected elements of preparation, I think, is that people don't necessarily spend as much time looking at the current research as they could. And this is a very exciting area. We have seen activity in parts of the brain that are not normally used, which could, of course, explain why it is that people see these effulgent, geometrically intricate patterns of color almost universally, with from ketamine to ayahuasca. They're very similar. Everyone sees them the same way. We know this because artists have depicted them. And of course, this sort of consensus about an observation suggests very strongly that these are something that is real. And since we know that we see 0.0035% of the full spectrum of light, only 4% of the universe is an observable type of matter, I think it's, it's quite likely that these observations are something that is real, but just not normally perceptible to us. This unusual electrical activity that's been observed in these unused parts of the brain could also be the part of the brain that deals with ESP. I've made a video about ayahuasca and telepathy that goes into this in some detail. I'll put a card. So let's talk about some of the other changes in the brain. Uh, in the brain there are arbors, which uh, the tree of life of the brain. It's really interesting to look at some of the graphics that you can find online because uh, this very much reminds one of the network of roots in the mycelium that trees will use to communicate. The dendritic branches and synapses work in very much the same way and with the same sort of network of chemicals and proteins. All psychedelics have also been shown in brain scans to improve cross connectivity. Uh, with psilocybin for example, there are parts of the brain that normally have no communication that are communicating very, very heavily. And it doesn't stop there. Psilocybin has been observed, for example, to actually rejuvenate damaged and dead brain cells, something that was thought to be totally impossible prior to this discovery. The effect of this neurogenesis with psilocybin in particular is so powerful that doctors are actually currently performing experiments to see if they can rejuvenate totally brain dead patients that have been unreachable through any other method known to modern science. And there is a good degree of confidence that they will be successful in this. The primary mechanisms that allow these substances to have the effect that they do in the brain are neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to create new pathways. Over time, our habits and beliefs become deeply integrated. Uh, one way to think about it is like when water runs over stone repeatedly for hundreds and hundreds of years and it actually changes the shape of the stone. This is what happens with our habits and beliefs. And so psychedelics increase the brain's ability to change these neuro nets and formulate new ones. Neurogenesis refers to the process of actually lengthening the arbors and actually increasing the number of dendrites and dendritic spines, which of course allows for the formation of new synapses. These synapses are the connections where the information is exchanged. So if you consider that the brain is known to have more connections than the Milky Way galaxy has stars, this is a tremendous amount of new brain activity. The numbers from one study was that these new neuropathways are forming at a hundred times the normal rate. So if you consider that there are trillions of connections, this is a tremendous amount of new brain activity. The issue here, <clears throat> neuroplasticity and neurogenesis can also be counterproductive. 
because if you're not focused, if you don't have your clear intent, you could just be forming these new neuro nets almost at random. So occasionally you'll see people that have taken a lot of psychedelics and they've apparently become, you know, a little bit dislodged from reality. And this is because if you do not take them with the serious focused intent, you're just making a whole bunch of random connections and it's just a bunch of gobbledygook with no rhyme or reason. So just based on this modern research, it's, it's pretty easy to see why these compounds are so efficacious at producing these healing effects and expanding our parameters of perception. Issues such as addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression have a very high rate of comorbidity, which means that they often uh, present together in patients. And the way that these compounds work on the brain actually reverses the effects of cortical atrophy, which means basically that brain cells have been shriveled by these emotional and neurological aberrations. It is my opinion that because of the way the brain works, we can consciously direct the programming. And I think it's important to be aware of the research and the science behind this because I believe that having a working knowledge of these processes will actually increase your ability to engage them for your benefit. Another benefit of staying abreast of research is that some of the things that have been discovered are counterintuitive. For example, lower doses of psilocybin cause greater neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, but higher doses of psilocybin actually have the opposite effect. Also with ketamine, they discovered that small doses of ketamine don't really help much with depression and higher doses are miraculous in terms of creating new imprints and undoing the atrophied cortical neurons. One of the common criticisms that is often levied at people for using psychedelics is that people believe that you should do it naturally, as if taking a plant is somehow unnatural. Uh, my response to that basically is that this seems to be some kind of holdover from religion, the idea that we were created perfect. That's absolutely not true. And I do believe that there is some kind of consciousness that permeates the universe, but without process, there's really nothing to do. I find this sort of akin to telling someone that they should run a cakewalk or a program intended for a modern Mac on a Commodore 64 from the 80s. When you take psychedelics, you, when you complexify the arbors and extend the links, you're literally upgrading your hardware. And it's just not possible to run software on a CPU that is not designed to handle it. And that is what the evolution of consciousness is really doing to our biocomputer. As far as choosing the right medicine goes, there's co-efficacy across the board with all of these compounds. They all help to heal emotional traumas. They are all capable of increasing intelligence, expanding creativity, enhancing memory, all of this stuff. But some of them are better for certain applications than others. Ketamine or MDMA, for example, might be better for someone with PTSD because they might have more of a chance of having a psychotic break. The more powerfully hallucinogenic substances may not be as appropriate for these individuals. Also, Compounds like LSD that have less physical symptoms are going to be better for artists and athletes. And they might, that might sound a bit crazy to say that LSD will assist athletes, but it has come out in recent years, for example, that X Games athletes will take 100 micrograms of LSD as a pretty much routine practice, and it's considered cheating because their imbalance and all of the other expressions of their body-mind relationship become more concise and their performance capacity is enhanced. The same is true of musicians and other types of artists. Understanding and accepting this will save you considerable headache in terms of mitigating doubt and uncertainty regarding these substances. So let's talk a little bit about intention. It's very important to have a clear and concise intention going into these experiences, but also a conviction to follow through, a determination to integrate your experiences. And we'll talk a little bit about some things that you can do to ensure that you're efficacious at that. You must come into the psychedelic realm with a real willingness to change. Most people don't really want that. We come to identify with our shadow self just as much as any other part. And often the process of releasing that which does not serve us can feel like an actual death. This is the ego death experience that is so commonly reported. Difficulty with this part of the process can vary hugely from person to person. But how you prepare for a high dose experience 
can greatly influence the difficulty of this part of the process. Another major source of difficulty is that as you complexify your physical brain, the parameters of experience that are available to you actually change. And this is the synchronicity experiences and telepathy and intuition that I was referring to earlier. These experiences can definitely threaten a strict materialist cosmology or worldview. And it's often very difficult for people to redefine their experience. I mean, this is why people are so invested in political parties, in religion. When you think you know, when you believe that you have the answers, it's very comforting. And one of the very likely consequences of taking psychedelics is that your worldview is going to be totally reformatted. And for a lot of people, this feels like insanity. It feels like a schizophrenic breakdown. Meditation and focused intention in your daily life will keep you safe. You can also call on the support of myself or other integration specialists if you feel like you need assistance. Although I do very strongly encourage people to deal with as much of this process on their own as possible. Okay, and so now the number one practice for getting the most mileage out of your psychedelic experiences Increasing your metaphysical metabolism and catalyzing your consciousness is mindfulness. Mindfulness is number one. This must become constant for anyone that wishes to attain to their highest potential. This is actually a very simple thing to do, but it can be very difficult. But as with anything else, your ability will improve with practice. But you analyze your thoughts, you analyze your actions. In my experience, everyone has sort of this voice of a higher self. I've, I've talked to a lot of people about this and it's, it seems that People may be aware to varying degrees, but I think everyone has it. And so every time you did something that was not the right decision, there's that higher part of yourself that knows. Whenever you engage in automatic or habitual behavior, there's that voice of your higher self that you have chosen to ignore. So in the occult, they call this knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel contacting the higher self. And really, in the Western occult mystery tradition, it is the ultimate goal of all magicians and should be also the ultimate goal of every person. Neuroscientists measure the degree of consciousness according to that animal's awareness of itself. This is really at the heart of our work. We all have cognitive dissonance, cognitive bias, and delusions. I was recently involved in a debate about the shape of the earth. Although at the end of the day I still think it's a sphere, I had to admit to myself that I had an opinion that was not based on my own direct observation which is generally against my rules. And it gave me pause to consider that there may be other areas in my life where I have these beliefs that are what I think of as silhouette imprints. Uh, they can be just cultural conditioning. For example, one of the goals of this mindfulness practice is to look for imprints from the dominant religion in your culture and try to neutralize them. Because even if you're not Christian or Catholic or whatever the dominant prevalent religion in your culture is, you're still very likely to have been influenced in your sexuality and in other habits and expressions of your life. And so this is a good way also to cultivate mindfulness, to look for schematics, find your influences and analyze yourself to see where they might be present. We must cultivate our willingness to shed these aberrations and vigilantly develop our powers of objective analysis. And in reality, there's really nothing that needs to be done prior to these experiences that shouldn't be part of your normal routine, except maybe in the case of ayahuasca or some practice that requires a dieta. I should mention a little bit about the use of tobacco because this is a very important aspect of uh, plant medicine that can be underrated, I think, because a lot of us are coming from cultures where tobacco is viewed as a poison and strictly a drug of abuse. And the truth is that if nothing else, tobacco has the capacity to very, very quickly and powerfully focus the mind. And because a lot of our work has to do with the relationship between energy and consciousness, when you take tobacco either inhaled through the nose or as rape, this focusing of the mind, especially in this state of openness, the filters are down, your consciousness is very directly engaged with the energy of creation. When you take this tobacco, it's giving you a tremendous amount of power to effectualize your will. In the coming weeks, I'll continue this series with more videos that go into depth in regards to the specific categories of plant medicine and psychedelic compounds. So be safe out there. Hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon, and we'll see you 